family. How's everybody doing today? Man, you're looking good, all filled up. I was surprised when I come in there, they had a, a stanchion. Did y'all know that's the proper name for that thing right there? That thing where they had? I thought it was just a rope. Come on, somebody. But somebody told me, Pastor, that. that's a stanchion. I said, ooh, you bougie. So they had it roped off, and I told these people, I said, how bad you got to be to get roped off in church? I mean, you know, they, they, well, you're not getting out. These people over here are not getting out. If you got a baby, you are not getting out today over here. But it just, and then they let Chris do the roping off when y'all know Chris White needs to be roped off. Come on, somebody. And he's the one doing it. But we are so glad to be, got a big football game today. I don't want to see no fight now. A couple weeks ago, we had the Niners and the Cowboys. Today, we got them dirty birds and the Cowboys. And I see nobody fighting today. But if y'all going to have a barbecue, holla at your boy. Come on, somebody. Um, Anyway, I, I'm so glad what God's doing at the worship center this past week. We did our first encounter center uh, service over at Brownfield, and we had 12 people get baptized, man. 12 people moved from death to life, and so that's real exciting. We're so happy with what the Lord's allowing us to do in Brownfield. And uh, today, for the next few weeks, we got both of our campuses tuning in with us. So this morning, we got the South Campus, uh, we got Brownfield, we got Overflow, and then they just told me we got Overflow to the Overflow out in the foyer this morning. So can we welcome everybody today? Thank you for being here, man. Well, I, this, uh, this next series I got coming out starting today is based off what the Lord kind of dealt with me on while I was gone on sabbatical. Some of you know, some of you may be new today, but I took a break uh, at the end of June and I was gone for six weeks. And that's the first time in 32 years I've ever missed more than one Sunday. Well, actually at the worship center, I've only been here 27 years. But the first time ever in any ministry that I've missed more than one Sunday in a row at the church. And, and I just struggled with doing that. Um, pastor Jackie White, who is the founding pastor at Church on the Rock, is my pastor. He pastors me well. And my dad passed away about six years ago. And when my dad passed away, Jackie said, man, I really want you to take a break. Uh, I really want you to go think some things through. And and, and get your head on straight. Because we had, I've had people pass away in my life before, but my dad was kind of my hero. He's kind of the, the one that set the tone for everything that I do. Does that make sense to anybody? And, and here's what I found out when my dad died, is I knew my heart could be broke. I didn't know my soul could get broke. Does that make sense to anybody? But my soul got broke, and, and Jackie was like, Todd, you really ought to take a break. And, and here's why I didn't take a break. I'm wired a little bit different than other people. If I would have sat down in that season of brokenness, I don't know if I would have ever got back up. Does that make sense? And people are like, no, you, you love to preach. And I, I, I do love to preach. But again, that was a season of my life that I had no bearing for. I'd never been there. You don't know till you know. You don't know till you get there. And so what I, what I struggle with a lot, and I think what a lot of people here may struggle with, is are we perfect or are we perfected? And, and I think when you strive to be perfect, man, it can get exhausting, right? It, it, you just wear yourself out trying to be all things to all people, and, and it just can't be. Even Jesus. Jesus couldn't even meet the needs of everybody. He, he was healing the world, and blind eyes, and the lame were walking, and the dead were raising, you know, and everybody. And, and they still said he didn't do enough. So I don't, what, what else did he have to do to get everybody to get on the same page with him? And so I think sometimes as we go through life, we're so busy trying to get everybody's approval that it kind of wear, wears us out and wears us down, man, trying to be all things. Does it, am I making sense at all? And, and so I want to spend a couple of weeks talking about perfect or perfected, and this morning we're going to talk about perfectionism. Next week, I'm going to talk about stress a little bit, but I want to talk about perfectionism, and most likely... You are sitting by somebody who's suffering from this, and they don't even know that they're suffering for it, but I want you to listen to this message for you and not your partner, because sometimes you'll be elbowing them during church like, he's talking to you. <laughs> this is all you today, player. This is all you. He is on you, and so I want you to listen to this for yourself and not for your spouse or for your friend, okay? And then the word perfect just gets thrown out kind of easily today, like it's a buzzword. You ever get invited for lunch and somebody goes, hey, you want to go to lunch today? And you're like, yeah, I'm a fat boy. Of course I do. And 
We're going to go to Mexican food, though. Come on, somebody. Five days a week, that's where Pat, you want to find, look for me. You're looking for Pastor Todd, find a Mexican food restaurant, love it. You will find me somewhere with salsa all over me just going in. I go in, come on, somebody. If you don't come home with some evidence on your shirt, did you even eat? You got to have something on there. And, and, and so I'm like, what time do you want to go? And I'm like, 11.45, and then they send back, perfect. And I'm like, all of a sudden, like, ooh, that's a lot of pressure. Like, I just wanted to go to lunch. I didn't want to be perfect at lunch. I just wanted a lunch. Now you put perfect on there. Now that's a whole nother standard. And I don't know if I can meet perfect. I don't know if I could do it because I'm going to spill on my shirt. I'm going to tell you, I'm, I, whatever. I, I can't go eating somewhere without taking some of the restaurant home with me. If you get in my truck, my wife's got them little shout-out wipes in my dashboard so I can clean myself up so I can go back to work look like halfway decent. And, and it's just a struggle, but they use the word perfect. Like, how are you doing today? Perfect. Oh, that looks perfect. But does it really? Does it really look perfect? And, and, and I struggle with stuff like that, and there's so much pressure. So here's the thing I want to tell you. Point number one, I'm not perfect. Now, when I say that, I want you to say that. I'm not perfect. Here we go, all together. I'm not perfect. Now, some of you are arguing like, he ain't talking to me. I just said it because he asked me to, but I already know I'm perfect. And, and th this is first person. Webster says this about the word. Perfect means to be entirely without fault or defect. Boy, that's a lot of pressure right there. Without fault, without defect. And it's easy to say we're not perfect, but it's hard to live. But Romans 3.23 says this, for all, somebody say all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That scripture, and if you say, man, I want to lead somebody to Jesus. I really don't know how to do it. You use that scripture. Use Romans 6, 23. Use Romans 10, 9. It's called the Roman road. You can lead somebody to Jesus really quick with just those three scriptures right there. But this word sin in, in the Greek is harmonato. Most, most Greek words, over 50% of them either have a sporting context or a military context. And so when the Bible says, you read, that take every thought captive, that word captive is a military context. When the Bible says, let the peace of God rule in your heart, the word rule in the Greek has a sporting context. It means to umpire. It means to let the peace of God tell you if it's safe out there for you or not. Come on. It's a peace of God. Should you do this or not? You need that in your life. Now, this word harmonato has a sporting context, meaning to miss the mark. And it's talking about archery right? And, and, and you got your, your target on there and you're shooting from, uh, for the bull. Anybody here bow hunt? Well, we got to get some more rednecks in this church. I'm going to tell you right now, got enough redneck. We, it's just like me and this dude right here, the only ones hunting. The rest of y'all just living your life, right? And, but my boy Johnny Campbell, he's one of my best friends. We've been best friends for 52 years. He got this bow a couple years ago, about 10 years ago. Todd, I got this new bow. You need to come try it out. I'm like, nah, bro, I don't want to do that. That looks hard. Both of my rotator cuffs are tore, and I don't get them fixed because as long as I can swing a golf club, I'm not getting cut up. Come on, somebody. And, and so I can still swing it. You with me, Chad Ford? Chad's been with me. Chad knows how bad I am, but I still go every week by faith. <laughs> By faith, and it's going to be better this week. And, and so I, he talks me into going over there, and he's got one of these squares, and, and you pull that bow back, and it broke all real, real easy. It broke over real easy. And, but what he didn't tell me is if you don't let that thing go right, it's going to come back and slap you right here. When you get slapped right here with that bow, you, you say words you can't say at church. Whether you at West Campus, South Campus, or Brownfield, like, it's going to come out. Come on, somebody. Pray for your pastor. I was like, Gee. and And he's like, man, it'll, it'll heal up. I'm like, it's raw, bro. Like, it's raw. It's no skin there. Like, I'm out. I'm out. And he's like, no, you come try it again. Now he's got a crossbow. And he's like, come try the crossbow. I said, I got one. It's called a 30 out six. Right, I, that means I'm hunting with my rifle. I'm out on the bow game. Pop one time, that's, I'm, I'm done. I love Todd. Todd don't like to hurt like that. 
and, and that, was a, that was a mistake I could have avoided if somebody would have told me what to do. But nobody told me. All of a sudden, I'm shenanay. Nobody <laughs> told me. And so, I don't, but it's talking about when you miss the bark and, and, and when the arrow hits the bullseye. But I want you to think about this. It's the bullseye, not hitting the target. So you got this big target with this bullseye, and the arrow may land out one or two rings, right? You're out here. You're still on paper, but you're not in the center of the bullseye. That's what this word sin means. It doesn't mean debauchery. It means you barely miss the center of the bullseye. So when the Bible says all have sin, you'll hear somebody say, well, you know, I, I've made a few mistakes. No, no, no. None of us have hit the center of the bullseye every day, all day, every second of the day. Would you agree with me on that? No, none of us have done that. Perfectionism, what I'm trying to tell you, is an unreachable goal. You cannot be perfect. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you can't be perfect. Now look at your second choice, say you too. Now some of you just got your feelings hurt because you found out you were second best. Come on, somebody. You thought you was the best thing since Big Red. You going home like, I didn't even know. Nobody even told me. Nobody loves me like that. And the sad thing is, though, we will wear ourselves out trying to achieve something that we cannot achieve. We'll have anxiety about it. We'll be worried about it. And it wears you out trying to be perfect. You can't do a perfect job. I cannot preach a perfect message. There have been times that I thought, sure, I rung the bell today. That's it. Boom. Put me somewhere. I done did it. And then I go home and I ask Trish, I said, what'd you think about that message? I said, didn't you think it was perfect? She's like, well. I'm like, thank you, Job's comforter, you know. And so she's, well, you know, you said this and you were supposed to say that. And, you know, you said there was 10 disciples and there's 12. You said there was 12 commandments and there's 10. And I'm like, well, you pay a little bit too much attention right there. What you need back at the... But she blows it up. You know what I'm talking about? And I'm like, man, I thought I did a pretty good job. And I admit, I am a recovering perfectionist. If you walk with me, if you spend time with me, you'll know about this. And I really don't know how much a recovery I am because I'm very OCD. I'm very detailed oriented. Like if you invite me over to your house and your pictures are crooked the whole time I'm in your house, I'm just like, how do y'all even sleep here? If your, cur your, if your furniture's not set up symmetrical, I'm just like, oh. <laughs> I can't do it. I, can't, I go to the bathroom, and I, I'm like, can I use your bathroom? I'm about Jesus, fix these people right now. <laughs> they, they crazy up in this place. But that's how my mind works. Like, I'm very detail-oriented. It drives me insane. When the chairs are crooked like this, and I'm just like, somebody fix the chairs. I, 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 I can't do it. I can't take it. And, and so... Let me just tell you how you can spot a perfectionist. And, and some of you will like this and some of you not. When, when I say this, some will say, I have said that, but I'm not a perfectionist. And you know how I know I'm not a perfectionist? I perfectly well know that I am not a perfectionist. Did you just hear what you said? You perfectly well know that you're not, it's, it's a sickness and you don't know how to fix it. And, and here's what people will tell you. Well, I don't really struggle with it too much. To be perfectly honest, <laughs> perfectly honest, I don't struggle with this. Right, listen to the words out of your mouth and God sees you. But I've struggled with this my whole life. My clothes have to match down to every detail. You will never see me out and my clothes do not match. If you see me out and my clothes do not, call the police because somebody kidnapped me and made me dress like that. <laughs> they made me dress like that. They just let me out the cage just long enough to run up to Walmart. <laughs> and nobody caught me because everybody at Walmart was dressed the same way. <laughs> But if you see me anywhere at the gym, no, you ain't going to see me at the gym, but <laughs> if, if you see me driving past you at the gym, my clothes match. If you come to my house while I'm mowing the yard, my clothes match. I don't even mow the yard anyway. If, <laughs> let me change it. If you see me washing my car, my clothes match. I always have to match. I pick out my outfits on Saturday what I'm going to wear on Sunday because it caused me so much stress to make sure my stuff matches. 
So I'm like in there, like this morning, I had a whole other shirt I was going to wear today. But it was real busy, and I thought, well, people be trying to read my shirt rather than listen to the message, and I don't want anyone to do that, but I need to wear my new shoes that I just got, so I got to find something that goes with my new shoes so I can look cute for everybody when I get there today. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. And you think, you don't really do that. Ask my wife. Ask, my, my wife is dressed already out the door, and I'm like, ah, what are we going to do? I can't look ugly at church today. I can't be the one that looks like they don't have friends. Come on, somebody. I, I, I just struggle with that, and, and I tell you, I'm, I'm crazy about it. And if I'm talking to you out in the foyer, and I've got something in my teeth, for the love of God, tell me I got something in my teeth. If I got a booger in my nose, don't let me walk around the house of God. Well, okay, glad you're here. Hey, good to see you. And everybody's like, did you see that booger in his nose? And nobody told that. You saw it, and you gossiped about it. And you didn't tell, my pants are unzipped. Tell me my pants are unzipped. Don't let me be on somebody's TikTok tomorrow. Come on. <laughs> I, I just, you, are you with me on this? I want to know if my breath stinks. Tells me. Don't let me walk up to everybody praying for everybody. How you doing in the name of God? Well, I was doing better till you got here. <laughs> when I got here, I just need prayer for my, 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 my marriage. But right now, I need prayer for my nose. My nose, you, you smell like you come straight from hell, Pastor Todd. <laughs> You ain't never seen people come up there and pray and they smell like coffee and all that? They're like, the Lord saith. I'm like, ooh. I don't want him to talk to me right now. I don't want God talking to me right now if he's talking through you. That's why we got breath mints up here for all the altar. Tell them. Tell them, look, I want to hear from Jesus, but right now I cannot focus. Yeah. Do yourself a favor and get yourself a mint. Come on, somebody. They're all up here. They're free. And if you're getting prayed for and you need one, take one. Let the altar bear all those sins. <laughs> but don't you want to know those kind of things? Like, and that's how my mind works. It's like, why didn't somebody tell me? Or if I got a spot on my clothes or whatever, I want to know. I'm just saying I'm not perfect. And you're not perfect. So here's point number two. He is perfect. I'm not perfect, but he's perfect. Let me show it to you. Psalms 1830. As for God... His way is perfect. Now, we have a lot of people out in society right now that are saying, no, God's way is not perfect. But, but we just read a scripture that said his way is perfect. So if I don't like what the word of God says, it doesn't mean that his word's not perfect. It just means my flesh is out of control. Nobody likes to be told no. And so the word of God shuts us down on some things. Come on, somebody. The word of God has caused me, when I used to go to the gym a long time ago, it's caused me to move treadmills. Because the girl in front of me ain't got nothing on. She just barely got, I don't even know how she got there this morning with that less amount of clothes on. I'm like, I cannot stand here. Pastor, you shouldn't stay left. Okay, let me lie to you. I didn't even notice the hot girl standing in front of me with everything hanging out. If I stood there, I would have been, thank you, Jesus, for making this right here. Thank you. But you know what I was more thankful for? The woman he gave me at home. And I respected her enough to move over to somewhere else. So that later on, I'm not trying to fantasize about something that I don't even know. Picked up something I may have never wanted. You're not ready for me. When I got a woman that keeps me going the way I need to go, she's the mother of my son. She keeps our house going. And she makes our house a home. I take a check and she takes it home and makes it dinner. You're not hearing what I'm telling you. You think I'm going to step out on something like that over something I saw when God's already got, blessed me with everything I need? I'm not going to jeopardize that, and I'm not trying to be super spiritual, because there was times I was just like, oh, I'm glad I got this treadmill today. But there comes a time when you realize that you're drifting. Am I making sense to anybody? So his way is perfect. Psalms 19.7 says this, the law of the Lord is perfect. Here's one talking just about Jesus. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not, I love, this is one of my favorite scriptures. You, are, you need a favorite scripture? Here's one right here. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. What's that mean? Without ever missing the bullseye. Jesus had hit it every single time. Jesus 
never miss the mark. I'm not perfect, but my God is perfect all the time. And let me tell you something else about Jesus. The world examined him, and they could find no fault in him. The leader of the world could find no fault with him. Pilate said, I see he's done no wrong. And he said it three times. Watch this, John 18, 38. Pilate said to him, what is the truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews, and he said to them, I find no fault in him at all. John 19, 4, Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in this man. John 19, 6, Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, You take him and you crucify him, for I found no fault in him. No fault. That means our Savior is perfect. Can you say amen? amen? And we live in a world with a bunch of unperfect people. You are unperfect. You're imperfect. And I know that hurts your feelings because you think you're the best thing since hubba bubba. But you're not. You know how I know we got imperfect people in this world? Go to the gas pump. Why can't you round up? Why you got to get gas like 53, 52? Why you can't go to like 55? Or better yet, just go all the way to $54. That don't bother you at the pump and you pull up and somebody just put $53.03 in there and you're like. <laughs> you could pump it again, it's just vapor. Come on, you ain't gonna get much. It's $3 a gallon, you got enough room for the rest of that 70, uh, 97 cent. And them people are on my nerves, they on my last nerves. Like, well, how do y'all even function during the day? How'd you even get dressed? You can't even pump gas. Here's another thing that bothers me. Y'all ready? The left lane. The left lane is for people that have somewhere to be. The right lane is for people whose life is over. They don't, they don't have nothing to do. They don't have no, their highlight of the day is being in the left lane ruining my day. And, and that's why we don't have TWC bumper stickers. <laughs> we have Church on the Rock ones. <laughs> where you go to church? COTR, that's where I go. <laughs> you know, one time they put Church on the Rock bumper stickers on my truck. I said, y'all don't want that on my truck. <laughs> Because I'm the guy going around the loop, and you got, I got to look at you now. You put me in a place that I got to look at you like. And I got to slow down to look. Because you can't speed by and look. You got to let them know that you know I'm the only one. Huh? And you got real slow. And, that, and, I'm, and then I got Jesus' sister sitting with me in my truck. Pastor Trish. And Pastor Trish is sitting there going, oh, you tell them, babe. I bet they heard everything you said. You let them know. That's right. You're the big man out here. You're the best driver in the world. You're this. You're that. I said, girl, there ain't nobody in the right lane. You finna be in it. <laughs> if you still here when I come back by, I'll give you a ride. <laughs> She aggravates the thunder out of me, man. She's just like, mm, 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 I bet they got, do you feel better now, Todd? Do you feel better? That's what I got to live with. Ain't bad enough I got the Holy Spirit. I got the Holy Spirit sister sitting with me riding everywhere. And they're like, Todd, they may be good. <laughs> Can I tell you something real funny and let me get back to this? One Sunday I was coming to church and somebody was in the lane over here to get into church and I was like, dang, come man. They might as well just park that thing and paint a fence around it as fast as they're going. They're going to church by covered wagon, or where, where are they going? By covered wagon. And then they pulled into the church parking lot, and I was like, oh, it's egg. Oh. <laughs> Here I am behind them the whole time. And so if they would have asked me, was you yelling at me? I was like, girl, no, I was listening to worship. <laughs> I'd have straight up lied. I ain't going to say, I prayed about it later. I would have told them to. <laughs> Oh, man. See, I need to pray for me. I need some help. <laughs> Telling you I need some help. But the left lane people, please, uh, if you love God at all, <laughs> get off of there. Get out of there. Just don't do it. Because there's other of us that want to go to heaven, and we can't as long as you're in front of us. <laughs> we can't. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. So the rest of the people are like, I'm getting in the left lane when I leave here. That's what I'm going to I'm going to show that fatty. Uh, all right, now I'm going to show you. <laughs> number three. First off, I'm not perfect. He's perfect. Here's number three. I am perfected. Now, we had a lot of fun and we joked around, but please don't miss out on the last part of this message. I am perfected, and so are you as a believer in Jesus. I preached all of that to get here. We are perfected by grace. We are perfect in the Father's eyes. Remember the, remember the definition a while ago? Perfectionism, without fault, without defect. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, when that blood has been applied to your sins, the Father now sees you without fault, without defect. Listen to me, what about the abortion I had? Without fault, without defect. What about the, the divorce I had? Without fault, without defect. What about my past? Without fault, without defect. What about what I did yesterday? If you bring it under the blood, it's without fault and without defect. You can't do it for yourself. You've gotta have the blood of Christ. And when you have the blood of Christ, you're not perfect, but you get perfected in him and you are found in the eyes of the Father without fault and without defect. Oh, this is so good, man. If you catch this, you'll never be the same again. And I want to show you in Scripture, that, that a, a, a Scripture here that most people say, man, I don't have any understanding of it. I'm going to tell you, you will not understand this Scripture I'm about to read if you don't read it with the lens of grace. Even when you read the Old Testament, you have to read the Old Testament through the lens of grace. And you say, well, we didn't get that until the New Testament, really, because he says, says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you gotta have it all the through there, okay? Now this passage is from the Sermon on the Mount, probably his most famous message he ever preached, and, and, and it may have thrown you for a loop. Watch it, lean in real good at Brownfield and at South Campus. Here we go in overflow, Matthew 5, 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Have you ever read that and, and, and you've been in there and you're like, therefore be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect and you just went, I, I, I can't do that. There's, there's, there's like zero hope for me because I can't fulfill that scripture. What am I gonna do? I've blown it too many times. And Jesus not only says, watch this, let me lean in. He says, not only do I want you to be perfect, but then he throws this in there. I want you to be perfect just like my dad's perfect. That's a lot of pressure. Man, that's just like, well, just forget it. Then I'll just give up and I'll just go back to serving the world, man. And, and I wanna tell you, you don't have to be perfect when you have grace in your life. Look at this. There is no way to understand this scripture except for grace. So let me read it again with some, script, some words highlighted. Therefore, you shall be. Somebody say, shall be. Yeah. All of our campus say, shall be. Yeah. Shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Shall be. Watch this. That's future. Come on, I got good news for you. You're not perfect now, but you shall be. You're, you're not now, but once Jesus is gonna do what he's gonna do on the cross, then you will be perfect and you will be complete in the eyes of the Father, lacking nothing. You'll be perfect in the sight of God once I do my part. This word perfect in the Greek is teleosis. It's an adjective which is describing a noun, which is us. We're the people, but hear what it means. It means complete. You shall be complete. Sometimes it's translated as finished. You shall be complete once Jesus completes us. The other word is finished. Let me show you where the verb is in the Greek of the word teleo. This is the verb and the action. Watch John 19 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. It is done. It is complete. This is the exact same word that we just read in Matthew chapter 5 that translate as perfect. Jesus is saying, the work I just did on the cross is perfect. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It 
is finished. I've done the work now. I was describing how you would be once I did the work on the cross, but now I've done it. Because of what I did, you have been made perfect. You have made complete in the eyes of the Father. So when God looks down on you, when you have applied the blood of Jesus to your sin, he don't see you as broke, busted, and disgusted. He doesn't see you as a slave. He sees you as a son, and he sees you as a daughter. You are a son and daughter of royalty. You've been made perfect, perfected by what he did. Though he was perfect, we're made complete. In other words, the work he has done, he referenced it many times. What did he say? I'm here to do the will of my Father. Not my will, but your will be done. Over and over again. And he kept telling the disciples, he said, here's how I'm going to do it. And I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to do it. And every time they did it, the disciples were like, no, 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 no. You can't do that. You can't leave us. And Jesus says, I've got to go. Because if I don't go, come on, you can't be made perfected. If I go, you stay broke. I got to go do this so you can get whole and you can get healed. He said, in order to do the complete work of my father, I've got to be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes, and I've got to be crucified, and I've got to get buried. But don't worry, in three days, I'll get back up. I will get back up. And they kept saying, no, God, no, Jesus, no. And, but let me show you some scripture where the Greek word is being made complete, made perfect. It's in the Bible. And you go back home. You, everybody needs to memorize this scripture right here. Don't forget the scripture I'm about to give you. Colossians 2.10. Everybody write that down. Colossians 2.10. Are you ready? And it says, you are complete in him. When somebody tells you you don't hit the mark, go back to your Bible. I am complete in him. When you feel like you failed as a husband or a daddy. I am complete in him. When you feel like you failed as a wife or a mama, you go back to the word and say, I am complete in him. I don't care what the world says. The Bible says I'm complete. I may have not met the mark, but he did. And because he did, I'm complete in him. Watch this. This is where Jesus says, I'm going to be made complete. He says, I'm going to be made perfected. Let me give you some context. This verse, uh, right before this, they said to him, Herod's going to kill you. They're trying to threaten Jesus, but Jesus didn't have no punk in him. You tracking with me? He ain't got no punk, right? And so they're trying to get him all uh, where he, head games. And just to show you how Jesus wasn't scared, look what they said to him. Herod wants to kill you, Luke 13. And Jesus said to him, go tell that punk. That's what, go tell the fox. Says Fox, but let me put it in 2023. Go tell that pump. Don't start none, won't be none. Huh? Because I stay ready. I ain't got to get ready. That's what he's saying. I don't know how y'all read y'all's Bible, but that's what I got. Oh, so, ooh, Jesus finna go night night. He finna put somebody out night night. Hair finna go to sleep quick, boy. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's not true, but it gets me excited right there to know that Jesus might, but don't start none. See it with your chest. Anyway, go. Behold, I cast out demons and I perform cures. Now he's going to reference the three days. Today, tomorrow, and the third day, I shall be perfected when I get back up. When he said you shall be perfect and the reason you're not now is because he hasn't gone to be perfected. In other words, I haven't done the complete work on the cross yet. But once I've done the complete work on the cross, you'll be perfect if you'll receive it. You don't have to strive for it. You don't have to worry about it. If you'll receive it, he can make you perfect. Now he's saying, I shall be, future tense, on the third day perfected, Hebrews 5, 9. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to everyone who obeys him. Isn't that great news? Everybody who obeys him, salvation is coming to you. All you got to do is obey. Come on. Obey, if you obey, you can slay. Come on, somebody. John 17, 23. This is the prayer in the garden when he's praying for us to be one. I and them and you and me, that they may be perfect in one. Hebrews 12, 23. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. That's us. Your spirit has made perfect what Jesus did. Galatians 3, 3. Are you so foolish Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? In other words, God did it. You can't, you can't do it for yourself. God did it. Hebrews 10.1. 
For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. That made perfect right there is the same Greek word. It's separated in the sentence, but he's saying that the law, those who approach by the law can never be perfect. In other words, when you come to God in religion, you can't, may be, you can't be made perfect. Religion, there's, do you realize there's no religion in heaven? So all of you that grew up Catholics, it's not going, you do you no good in heaven. I was a good Catholic. Jesus is going to say, what's Catholic? I was a good Methodist. Jesus was a Methodist. Well, I was a good Baptist. We were at buffet before everybody else every Sunday. <laughs> You can't even go to a good buffet. Once they shut furs down, they ruined our life. Come on, somebody. <sighs> Jesus, bring furs back to love in Jesus' name. You, you, you can't do it, man. You, religion, there's no religion in heaven. You know what's in heaven? Relationship. Oh, but I got a cross around my neck. Uh, <laughs> symbols aren't going to get you into heaven. Oh, I got a fish bumper sticker on my car. Oh. And probably get one of those dumb bumper stickers too. I, I, church bumper stickers get on my nerves. In case of the rapture, this car will be unmanned. If you've got to tell everybody that you're saved, then you're probably not saved. Your fruits are to tell that you're saved, not your bumper sticker. Oh, I mean, ain't I? I mean. Because some of y'all got a bumper sticker on there and y'all go around the loop just like I do. <laughs> Change that to Church on the Rock. If you <laughs> Let's go a little further, and I'm almost done. Because I want you to stay with me, because if you catch this, you will stop trying to be perfect when you catch that you've already been made perfect in the sight of God because of what he did on the cross. I want to free you from some shame and some guilt of trying to strive to be all things to all people, which you can't. Even Jesus said, I'm going to go away. And the disciples, no, 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 no. And Jesus said, I've done everything I can from the outside. But I got to go away so somebody can come live on the, so the Holy Spirit can empower you to be what you can't be without yourself. It's only through the Holy Spirit that you can keep driving in the left lane. Come on. <laughs> I'm being serious. It's only through the Holy Spirit that you can do those things. Hebrews 7, 28, because this is what the law does. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses. But the word of oath, or that refers to new covenant, but the new covenant which came after the law appoints a son who has been perfected forever. That's talking about Jesus. One more, and this brings how we're still imperfect, but we've been made perfected. Hebrews 10, 14, this is another great one to memorize. For by one offering, what offering was that? One, Jesus on the cross, Right? By one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. He has perfected those who are still imperfect. Now listen, when you come to the altar and you ask God for forgiveness, there's a word that, that is called for that's called justification. And justification happens the moment. The moment you invite Jesus into your heart, you get justified right now. You're made brand new. Sanctification is what happens every day after that. You walk that out every day. We're, hopefully, we're becoming more like him and less like us. Come on, amen. And if there's still a whole lot more of you than there is his, then you gotta wonder if you ever got saved. Oh, I'm preaching better than you, amen. And if you got so much of your old life that nobody can tell by the fruit, not your bumper sticker, but the fruit, then maybe you're really not committed all things unto Christ. Are you still tracking with me? And when we come to, we are justified at that moment, but that word sanctified, that is something that happens every day after that. He has already made us perfect in the eyes of God or we couldn't go to heaven. When it dawns on you, what Christ did on the cross is complete. It will free you from being a slave to perfectionism and it will free you from being a slave to religion. You can be in a relationship because why? He's already perfect. 
perfected us. And I'm not perfected. I'm helping somebody right now. I'm not perfected by my, 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 my performance, but I'm perfected by my position before God. Let me say that again. You're not perfect by your performance. You're perfect by the placement that you now have in Christ. I'm not perfect in my behavior, but my belief puts me in a perfect relationship with God so that sanctification can show up every day of my life and I become more like him. My belief in Jesus, and I think there are a ton of people who struggle in this area. I think there are a ton of people. I'm one of these people. I am really good at giving other people grace. I'm not real good at getting grace to myself. And what I've noticed about most church people too is we're really good about giving grace to people who sin like us. But when their sin's different than our sin, we have no grace for them. And we try to categorize sin. And we try to say, that, well, if you're homosexual, that's level 10. I'm just a liar. I mean, I just lie about everything. But I'm not gay. Come on, hear me. All sin. How much sin? Did it separate it? Then why are we? You have grace for people... If you're a liar, you have grace for other liars. You just don't have any grace for an adulterer. I'm, think about what I'm saying. You have grace for people that sin like you. But when it's something that you, oh, I could never be that. I would never, oh, God. Mm -mm, oh, oh, shit, oh. Yes, you could. You could be all of those things without Jesus. Without Jesus. You have no idea what you're capable of without Jesus. It's the grace of God that keeps you from going off in all those other areas. Yeah. It's not because you're so good. It's because our God is so great that he's perfected us by his work on the cross. A couple months ago at the end of June, and I'm almost done, I, I took a six-week break here at the worship center. It's the first time in 32 years I've ever missed more than one Sunday at a church. I've never missed more. Even when I had cancer surgery, I was cut from here to here. I had 72 stitches and I was up here preaching. So I went on sabbatical because Pastor Jackie, he says, Todd, you really need to take a break because there's some wear and tear. Can I just be real with y'all this morning? Without, I'm not gonna judge you and y'all don't judge me. Can we, could we have one of those moments where your pastor's just honest? After 32 years, what I begin to realize is I didn't like people no more. You say, well, that's terrible. You're a pastor. I know something was broke. Something was broke because if you know me at all, if I'm going somewhere, I want everybody to go. I don't want just like two or three. I'm like, just get them all. Let's all go. It's better when we're all together. Don't do life alone. And Trish would call me and she's, hey, Todd, Moose and Jocelyn, you know, Jocelyn up here with her. Thing, I, sh sh look, I bet she don't talk back to Moose no more. Y'all see that brace she's wearing? I bet she don't talk back to Moose no more. Sometimes you just got to put them in check. No, I'm just playing. And so she fell, trying to put up Christmas decoration. So I, I, I'm sitting there, and she goes, hey, let's go to eat. Moose and Jocelyn called us. I said, no, I don't want to go. Then the next day, like uh, some of our other friends, like, hey, well, they called. Let's go eat. I said, I don't want to go. After weeks of this, Trish goes, what's wrong with you? And I said, can I be honest with you? And she said, yeah. I said, I'm peopled out. Like nobody made me do this, but you ever got a time in your life where you feel like you had to perform for everybody? Nobody asked you to do it. You just kind of felt like if you didn't do it, you were letting people down. I need some real people up in this church. And so you're saying yes to so many things that you can't even do a couple of them right. Because you don't want to disappoint nobody, right? You don't want to disappoint nobody because if you disappoint somebody, they might find out you're human. And we can't let anybody know that we might be human. And we can't let anybody know that we might be tired. We can't let anybody know that we might just be worn out after 32 years of marriage counseling of 32 years of doing funerals, 32 years of brokenness. You, you might not want everybody to know that you're a little rattled because then they might think you're human. So I go on this break, and I'm just being raw with you. I go on this break that I don't even want to be on. 
Because I think you gotta be weak-minded to need a break. I'm just being honest with you. And I go on this break, and the first three weeks, all I hear is my dad's voice in my head. Now, my dad's old school. You go to work, and when you ain't working, you go to work. Anybody got raised by a parent like that? Uh, my daddy, grown man, living, I'm living in my own house, paying my own bills. And if my dad called me on Saturday, like 6 o'clock in the morning, I answer the phone like I've been up for three hours. I'm stone cold. And the phone ring, and I see my, hey, what's going on, man? What are you doing? I said, oh, man, I had to take a break to answer this phone. I'm hard at it. What are, whew, I didn't even have time to talk. What are you doing, you know? But that's just how he raised me, and he just put that in me. And so I don't know what you do if you don't go. But he always told me you can sleep when you're in the casket. You can get a break when you're dead. I'm like, I don't think you need one then, but okay. <laughs> but I'm not going to say that loud because, you know, he won't. <laughs> not this timeout stuff. We didn't have timeout. Timeouts when daddy went left-handed to right-handed. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and he's patriotic. He laid on the stripes and I saw the stars, bless God. <laughs> And, and so for three weeks, all I can hear is my dad. You know, my dad, he, BK worked with him at, at the co-op. And you know, when my dad left there, still for two years, he still got sick leave and, and all the other time. And some of the guys like BK and some other guys donated time for two years. My dad still got a check from the place he worked. That's how much time he had. That's just, that's just how he was wired. So for three weeks, I'm on, it's about six weeks, but the first three weeks, all I can hear is my dad saying, boy, get your butt out of bed. What are you doing laying down, Todd? What are you doing taking a break? What are you doing feeling sorry for yourself? Get, get up, boy. I'm disappointed in you. I can't believe I raised a punk instead of a man. Can't believe you let all this wear and tear get to you. Get your butt up out of that bed. Go back to work. Do what you need to be doing. You're an embarrassment to your wife. You're an embarrassment to your son. You're failing your church. You call yourself a man. Three weeks I heard that. And you don't pray to the dead. But I said, I said, man, I can't hear the voice of this ghost anymore. I said, Dad, you're ruining my time. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm sorry. I found myself saying I'm sorry to somebody that's not even in the room anymore. Daddy, I'm sorry that I'm a failure. I'm sorry that I'm broken. I'm sorry I'm disappointing my wife. I'm sorry I'm not living up to the standards that you set to me. I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry. But when my dad died, I knew I could hurt in my heart. I didn't know I could get broke in my soul. Nobody told me that something you could go through would, would lead you to depression. Because I was always told if you're a Christian, you don't get depressed. And here I was, a tongue talker, a believer, depressed, wondering how do I even get out of bed. And all I wanted to do was die. I didn't want to be here anymore. And in the middle of all that, greater than the voice of my dad's voice. And I will tell you, that's exactly how my dad sounded, but he did not sound like that the last 15 years of his life. But the enemy made sure that I didn't hear what he said when I was building the worship center. The enemy made sure he didn't, I didn't hear what he said when we were getting to go around the world and giving altar calls, preaching to thousands of people and hundreds of people getting saved and getting baptized. The enemy made sure that I couldn't hear my dad saying, I'm so proud of you, son. Don't give up. Keep going. I wish I could do what I never, all I could hear was the worst, never the best. Don't you see it's a ploy of the enemy to make you think that you have to be perfect. And you can't. And you weren't made to be perfect. And because you were broken, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's okay if you don't check everybody's boxes for you. 
It's okay if you have to disappoint some people. It's okay for you not to be superhuman. It's okay for you not to be a, a Marvel hero. Because if we're honest, sometimes we think we're superhuman, and when we don't hit that mark, we think we're subhuman. And here's the truth of God's word. He's just called you to be simply human. Not super, not sub, just simply human. And he knew you would struggle with this. And he said, I'm going to send you a comforter called the Holy Spirit so that you don't let the voices of dead people cause you to live in shame and guilt and condemnation. So you don't live your life worried about the opinions of others that you, you, maybe you hit it, maybe you didn't hit it. That's a lot of pressure, man. That's a lot of pressure to live up under, trying to make sure everybody loves you and every, ah, it's exhausting. Some of you walked in here this morning some of you at Brownfield, some of you at South Campus, some of you in Overflow, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. You are trying to live up to everybody's expectations when the Lord has just called you to be simply human. He didn't make you a human doing. He made you a human being. And the only way you can be is to rest in who he is and what he's done for you on the cross. And if you're not resting in that, then you're spinning your wheels trying to be all things to all people. And I want to remind you of somebody. Jesus was opening blind eyes, healing the deaf. Lame were walking. Dead were being raised. And they still said he wasn't enough. So if the master of the universe couldn't be enough to everybody, don't you think maybe there's some of you this morning that need to let yourself off the hook of trying to be all things to all people? And just be who God's called you to be, and that's enough. That's enough, because there's a million things. Listen to me. As gifted as my father was, there's a million things my dad could do that I couldn't do. But there's a million things that I can do that my daddy can't do. That not mean I'm better, just means we had two different ways of doing things. And God made you special. God made you the way you are, and you're not a failure if you can't do all of those things that everybody's putting on your plate. People got mad at me. I'm not a counselor. I'm genuinely a pastor. I want you to counsel me. I'm not a counselor. We have counselors on our staff. You know why? Because I hire the best people in the world. So if you come to me and I, say, I get you, hey, I'm going to put you with somebody. It's not because I don't want to spend time with you. It's because I, I want you to get to the best part. There's nothing more frustrating in the whole world than calling somebody that can't help you. You ever talk to that person? And you're on the phone like, okay, I know you can't help, but I need to talk to the one that told you to answer the phone. And they're like, well, they're not available. I said, what, can, what can I call them where well, you ain't answering? Because you ain't no help. That's why I, I want to get you to the right places, but I don't waste your time for me trying to be something. I'm not a counselor. I'm a pastor, but I'm not a counselor. And people, when you come to me for counseling, you're going to leave with your feelings hurt. That's, that's just the truth. Because I'm not a counselor. You got real needs, and I'm just like, okay, is there, is there an end to this story? Is there an ending? Land the plane. For the love of God, land, land, land. land. And you go talk to Pastor Shane, and Pastor Shane, he'll just sit in there with you all day. He'll knit with you. He'll draw pictures with you. <laughs> Pastor Jimmy over at South, same thing. They're, they're, they're gifted like that. But that doesn't make them better or worse. It just means that we're made different. And some of you have been trying to be all things to all people. And when you're not, you just, I'm just, I'm just a failure. And I want to release you of some of that guilt of being perfect this morning. But you're going to have to get honest and just say, you know what, Todd, you're right. I've been afraid to admit out loud that I'm not Superman. I've been afraid out loud that I'm not Wonder Woman. Can I take people already know? They already know. And the ones that love you are okay with you not being those things. What they're not okay with you being is somebody other than he made you to be. And when you're trying to be all things, you're exhausted. 
so you can't be what you were really made to do. Are, are, am I helping anybody at all? You, you can't do the one thing you were made to do. This is it for me. This, I love this. This is it. I love preaching God's word because I think I can take something that's really, really hard and make it really, really easy. I, I, don't, I don't try to talk to you because I think you're dumb. I, I, I talk to you because I'm dumb. This is the only way I can understand it. There's some of you who can do this way better than I can. But maybe you'll get your own church one day and you can do it. I already got one. So, and I'm okay with this. I'm okay with never going to Bible school. I'm okay with never been to seminary. I'm okay with all of those things. Why? Because I've just decided that I'm just gonna be simply taught and let him be the great God and I'm gonna fall in his grace. Okay? So, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads where you're at, whether you're in overflow, whether you're out there in the foyer, south, wet, wherever you're at, I want you to bow your head. And I want you to ask, God, what are you saying to me today? Holy Spirit, what are you trying to talk to me about? Some of you have been wrestling with condemnation for years, wrestling with shame and guilt for years, and you're trying to reach an unreachable goal, and I'm praying that through this message, you can give yourself grace and receive the grace of God. So nobody's looking around, whether you're at South Campus, West Campus, Overflow, I want everybody to respond that needs this this morning. You'll just be honest. Whether you come and let us pray for you this morning, you'll just be honest. Pastor Todd, I need some of God's grace because I am slap wore out trying to be perfect. If that's you, can I see your hand? Yeah, don't be ashamed of this. I'm not. At first, I was really shameful to preach this message this morning, and then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to be raw. Anybody else? Don't miss this. I am, I am tired of trying to be what everybody else has called me to be, and I can't even be what I'm called to be. Anybody else? Yeah. Now, in just a minute, our worship team is going to play a song. Whether you need prayer at South, at West, and Overflow, I just want you to respond. I don't want you to go home with that burden this morning. So as they sing that song, I want you to come. This doesn't mean you're not saved. This doesn't mean you don't love God. It just means I am exhausted and I need some help. The pressure is more than I can bear. I turn this over to our South Campus and the Brownfield Campus, Pastor.